G'day, I'm Paul. So Mazda has finally rolled out the special edition of the BT50 that we spoke about last year. It's not quite as hardcore as what we predicted it would be, but it's close enough. This is called the BT50 Thunder. So it's priced at around $69,000 for the automatic. The manual can be had for around three grand less. This is gonna compete with things like the Ford Ranger FX4 and Toyota Hilux Rugged X. So picture those cars that have some of these mechanical changes on the outside, but are still very much the same beneath the skin. Today, we're gonna to do a detailed review of this car. If you wanna skip ahead to other parts of the video, use the time codes up on the screen, or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and use the chapters below. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you press the bell icon and subscribe to our channel so you can find out every single time we drive a new dual cab ute. Let's talk exterior. Before I run you through the external changes, what about the colors? So seven external colors to pick from. They're all free, which is great news. Now, what actually changes here with the Thunder? Well, it all starts down the front here with this single hoop steel bull bar. You can hear that is very much solid. You've got a light built into the side there along with the indicator. You've also got this dual row light force LED light bar. So this is going to give you really nice projection at night time. So you can see straight down the road there. It's quite an aggressive looking steel bar. I actually really like the look of it, especially from side on it cuts in nicely. So this is going to be good if you're doing any off-road driving, any bumps and things like that. You're not going to damage any of the plastic panels on the car. The rest of that is all fairly straightforward. Over here, you've got your standard headlights, full LED arrangement there. Thing I don't love about this setup though, they've got this rubber here that protects damage from the car as it flexes, but behind there, you can see all the plastic molding for where the bumper normally joins. So I think they could have concealed that a little better. Now down here, you have 18 inch alloy wheels, and this is a dark colored wheel. You can get this as an accessory on the BT50 as it is, but it comes standard on the Thunder. There are wider wheel flares here, so you can see they stick out a whole lot more than the standard setup. Not really a huge fan of how that just starts there. Would have been good to have a little lip or something there to stop it looking like it was just bolted on, which I don't know, it kind of was. Um, all of this work was done here in Australia. This is a pre-production car, so this may not look exactly what the final car looks like, but all the work that they actually did to create this was done in Australia. And there's a chance they might even sell this overseas eventually as well, which is pretty cool. Around the side of the car, you have your indicator built into that wing mirror there, the chrome section on the top. These side steps are new, so plastic side steps, they're gonna prevent you from damaging things when you go over rocks. They feel nice and sturdy as well. Big side bolsters there, they match the front there in terms of how much they stick out. The Thunder decal, and if you didn't know it was Thunder, you could just have a look behind there because they've got clouds and stuff, which is cool. Uh, sports bar. Um, this looks interesting. So this gives it a really aggressive stance. It sticks up a little higher than the car though, which is um, interesting. I would have thought it would sit flush with the roof, but it's raised a little bit. And I think it's because it's attached to this rail here as opposed to the body of the car. And then you've got these little flares on the side as well. Now, come around to the rear. I'll show you what else has changed. So similar to the Hilux Rogue, you've got this electric tonneau cover. So one push of that brings it forward and clicks it into position. There's also an LED light off to the side. This is a pre-production car. So granted, this probably isn't what it's going to look like when it's delivered to the customer, but have a look at all the cables that are just sitting there exposed and over on that side as well. It's the same story under the bonnet with the battery terminals. Just looks a bit thrown together and doesn't really look like a proper installation. So let's hope that's fixed when they do have the production vehicle and it's not a pre-production model. Now in terms of dimensions, you've got about 1500 mil of load length, around 1500 mil of load width, almost 500 mil of load depth and 1120 millimeters between the wheel arches. If I close this up, you've got a step here to retrieve things from the tray and you also get a three and a half ton braked towing capacity. So we're inside the BT50. Let's start off with the key. Here it is here. You have lock, unlock, and then a remote start function, which will turn the car on and run the heater or the air conditioning, which is a handy feature. Then the Mazda logo on the back. It's a proximity sensing key, so you just leave that in your pocket, and then you have a push button start. Now let's talk styling. One of the things I like about the BT50 and the D-Max is that they've gone to a bit of effort to make it feel nice and premium inside. Now this car's nudging $70,000, which is a whole bucket load of money, but I feel that it looks classy enough to justify that price tag. So you've got these soft sections along the top with the stitching, You'll notice that the D-Max has storage up here, whereas the BT50 doesn't. And the other difference is the BT50 doesn't get cup holders under the air vents. But for the most part, this looks the same. I like the brown highlights in between here and also on the seats and the padding on the sides. This is all unique to the BT50 and it just gives it that air of luxury to it as well. Now, what about all your touch points? 
They are nice and soft. We have tested them all with our durometer. If you want to see how this car compares to other cars we've tested before, click on the link in the description. Now, what about build quality? Feels okay, a little bit of movement there on the sides and around that center console, but for the most part, this all feels well put together. Let's talk about infotainment. So nine inch infotainment screen, you have shortcut buttons down the bottom too. This is one of the better ones in the segment simply because it comes with some pretty advanced smartphone mirroring features. So if you do wanna have a detailed look at this infotainment system, click up here to watch one we recorded previously. I'll take you through just some of the basics here. So satellite navigation, you can turn those annoying beeps off by the way. Um, there it is there. It's an okay satellite navigation system. It can be a tiny bit laggy, but it does the job. Where it really shines though is with smartphone mirroring. So I'll show you Apple CarPlay. There it is there. So wireless, which means every time you jump into the car, it just connects on its own. Big screen integration there. Um, it's good. The only thing to keep in mind though, when it is wireless, it drains your battery pretty quickly. So you kind of have to plug your phone up anyway, because there's no wireless phone charging. So it's just something to keep in mind. And this is what Android Auto looks like click on that one there. So connected with a cable and then again full screen integration, smooth scrolling. Then on the radio front you have AM, FM, DAB plus digital radio and that's all sent through an eight speaker sound system with live surround sound. Ahead of the driver is another LCD display that has your trip computer details, your fuel levels, engine temperature, the works. That's also where you enable and disable some of the safety functions as well. It's good but I just wish there was a shortcut on the steering wheel or, or somewhere else that allows you to disable some of the safety features because it takes a while to rifle through that menu and you can't do it while you're on the move. In terms of safety, some of the notable highlights include autonomous emergency braking. There's a lane keeping assistant, a lane departure warning, a semi-autonomous steering function, blind spot monitoring built into the wing mirror. There's an auto dimming rear vision mirror, radar cruise control. You've also got a junction assist, which basically prevents you from driving across an intersection when other cars are coming. And finally, you have rear cross traffic alert. It's also front and rear parking sensors and a reverse view camera. I'll show you what that looks like. Pretty decent reverse view camera and then you've got guidelines there as well. Okay, I'm gonna stop for just one second. I'm gonna ask you guys a question. So $3,000, I mentioned at the start that that is how much extra you pay for the automatic transmission. So many people buy the autos. Why are you not buying the manual? Is it just because you're in the car all day long? Tell me what the appeal is of an auto over a manual, especially for three grand. Let's talk practicality and we'll start with connectivity. So you have one USB port, one auxiliary input, a 12 volt power outlet. Then on the storage front, you have storage for your phone down the front here. No wireless phone charging, but you can see it slides in easily down there. You can also pop your phone in there if you want. And what about your coffee cup? Now, I mentioned before that this doesn't have the cup holders in front of the air vents like the D-Max does. That means when you have a me-sized coffee, it literally just can't even touch the bottom of that because it's far too deep. So you've got to wedge it up with a key or a durometer or something like that. So yeah, not a great design and I wish they had the cup holders inside the doors. What about bottles though? So you can see there the bottle fits fairly easily. You've also got storage for the bottle inside the door. There's also this storage down here. There's a center console here. That's fairly deep. So you can see in there plenty of room. You also have two glove boxes. Well, one glove box down here that you can't really fit much else in once you have your manual in there. Then you have another one up the top. And slide a bottle in there fairly easily. And then finally, you have a sunglasses holder at the top of the cabin. Moving on to comfort. So you have dual zone automatic climate control. You also get heated seats for the first row. In terms of the seats themselves, I really like this design. They hug you in nicely. You've got the perforations on there as well. So if you do get sweaty in summer, you're not gonna get permanently stuck to the seat. The driver's seat is electrically adjustable as well. The steering offers both tilt and reach adjustment. And then finally, all of these controls are easy to reach. Okay, back seat, let's have a look at it. So before I hop in and show you how it all works, I wanna show you a secret hiding spot. So under here, you have two secret hiding spots. They are pretty generously sized, so you can pop your little bits and pieces in here so no crooks and thieves see them from the outside. And then behind here is where you'll find a jack and also two top tether points. We'll hop in, I've got a grab handle for grabbing. All right, so this is how much room I've got back here. Knee room is okay. 
not amazing. Um, toe room is okay, but not amazing as well. Headroom is pretty decent where we are. Now, what about storage for your bottles? So you have a center armrest here with two cup holders. So you can pop your bottle there or there. You've also got storage inside the door. You have rear air vents, USB charging, a little slot for odds and ends, a hook there for your groceries and probably other stuff that you've bought that you don't need, two map pockets, and you also have two ISOFIX points on the outboard seats as well. So we've hit the road in the BT50 Thunder. Now this is probably not going to be all that much of a revolutionary review because this is effectively the exact same car as the regular BT50, which we've already reviewed, but I'll take you through it all anyway, just in case you haven't seen that review. Powering this is an engine shared with the Isuzu D-Max. It's a three liter turbocharged four cylinder diesel, produces 140 kilowatts of power and 450 newton meters of torque. And that's made into a six speed automatic transmission. Now, what does all that feel like behind the wheel? Yeah, it's good. Um, I, I like that it's eager to respond, but it doesn't have to dive back through gears. Often find with some of these diesels that they have to snap back through gears, especially in the Fords with the 10-speed autos. Whereas this with the six-speed, it's confident enough to lean on the torque band when it needs to. And then other times when you do need a bit of poke, you just bury your foot, slingshots you forward and away you go. But it would be nice to see a 500 Newton meter option available. Our understanding was that this vehicle that they were developing would actually come with more torque as well. Uh, but it looks like they've just stuck with that original arrangement. In terms of fuel economy, Mazda claims an official figure of eight litres per 100 kilometres. We're currently sitting on 12.8, which is considerably higher. I wonder if all of the components they've bolted onto this have affected this. We have been doing a lot of low speed driving, so obviously that figure will be higher, but that seems unusually high for something like the D-Max or the BT50 that we've tested previously. Mazda doesn't provide an official zero to 100 time, but we thought we'd put it up against the stopwatch to see how it goes. Now let's talk about road noise. Uh, it's pretty quiet in here. The thing I am noticing though is wind noise and it appears to be coming from uh, the wing mirrors and potentially at the front there. So obviously a very different front end to the standard car and you can notice that as you're traveling along sort of 80, 100 kilometers an hour and feel it sort of infiltrating slightly. Keep in mind as well that, that sports bar sits slightly higher than the roof as well. So that will be catching some of the wind also. So what's the ride like? Given they haven't changed any of the suspension tuning, the only difference is the weight over the front there with that steel bar. It feels pretty much exactly like the BT50 felt previously. So it is nice and smooth, but it has a little bit of sharpness over bumps, especially here at highway speeds. You can hear the sort of jitteriness in my voice there, but it does feel a little more settled at the front end. So having the weight so far forward means that you're trying to distribute that a little further to the front and obviously the rear is unchanged. So yeah, I, th I think it does feel a little better, but there isn't a great deal of difference between this and a standard BT50. Let's talk handling for a second. So yes, I understand this is a dual cab ute, but let's see how it goes through our corners here. Tip it in, a little punch. Yeah, look, it's fine. Lane's fairly flat and settled there. It's not going to be a sports car anytime soon, but in terms of handling, it's perfectly fine. Let's talk visibility. It remains virtually unchanged from standard BT50. You can't actually see that bull bar at all down the front there. Uh, the other good thing as well is that because these components were, I guess, engineered by the manufacturer, the front parking sensors and all the safety systems still work perfectly fine. Uh, if you do go aftermarket, often a lot of those things either need to be recalibrated or they just don't work at all. So um, the advantage of buying this package is that this has all been fitted to work with all the standard safety systems. And then in terms of rear visibility, uh, the vision is good out the back there. You don't really have any blockage from those headrests. The wing mirrors are also massive as well with blind spot monitoring, so you get good vision down the side of the car. Turning circle, 12.5 meters. So it is on the bigger end of turning circles, but it is sort of pretty standard for a dual cab ute with all wheel drive. So it's tight, but you should be able to make your three point turns. 
Okay, let's do a little bit of light off-roading. Now, because this is effectively the exact same as the BT50 with the addition of all these little bits and pieces on it, the off-road credentials are the same. So that means a ground clearance of 240 millimetres. You have an approach angle on the standard BT50 of 30.4 degrees, but here, because of that different front end, it is reduced to 25.8 degrees. The departure angle remains the same though, and that's 24.2 degrees. Now, in terms of the four-wheel drive controls themselves, this is a full-time two-wheel drive, and then it also has four-wheel drive high range, four-wheel drive low range, a rear differential lock that only works when it is in low range, and a hill descent control. Now, if none of that makes any sense, have a look at our four-wheel drive controls explained video where I give you practical examples of where you should and shouldn't use some of these features. So let's try Log Mountain. So what I'll do, I'll put it into four-wheel drive high range. It is really muddy around here at the moment. So normally they walk up here without any dramas at all, but I'll be keen to see what happens today as we approach. I'm going to kill that parking sensor as well. All right. Because it doesn't have all-terrain tyres, the standard highway terrain tyres are just going to be filled with mud. But it is walking up here pretty effortlessly. We have the traction that we need. I'll we'll turn this corner to head down our hill. Okay, so we don't have any extra ground clearance, but you will notice the front bull bar that they've added actually has a protective plate there for the underbody of the car. And we've got a rock right in the centre here that we're going to nudge on the way down is just there. I can hear it scraping on that plate. So that's going to be handy if you do go off-road or if you add a little bit of extra lift to these because it should mean that you get more protection for the underbody. All right, crawling down here. Let me pop the hill descent control on as well. We'll give that a little shot. There it is there. That is active. Let go of the brake. That's not too bad. It's not running away too much. But like I've said in the other videos, I think I just prefer to do that myself. But there you go. Not too bad. Doesn't feel any different to the BT50, but you have the extra protection under the front there to keep things safe. Okay, so Mazda BT50 Thunder. What do we reckon? Um, look, I'm in two minds. I think it looks really cool. They've done a good job with the styling at the front there. I think the flared wheel arches kind of give it a bit of presence, but it's like they ran most of the marathon and then just stopped right near the end. It really should have all-terrain tires, maybe have a lift and also a snorkel. Uh, and I really just am not a fan of the wiring and, and how sort of unfinished it looks. But like I said, this is a pre-production car. So I'm gonna reserve judgment until I actually see a production car. And hopefully by that point, the wiring will all look nice and neat and finished. So let me know what you think in the comments section below. Yes, you do get a lot of value with the extra stuff that they've bolted onto it. But do you think it's complete? Do you think it could do with just a couple more bits and pieces to help it have that image? So let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Have you ordered one? Are you going to order one? And if you aren't going to order one, what are you going to order instead? I always like hearing from you guys and the people that actually buy these things. So if you did enjoy this video, make sure you share it with your mates. Hit the like button. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel. But until next time, take it easy.